Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you once again for the privilege of being here to study your holy word. We ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit as we open to the book of Genesis. Help us to understand the great issues that are brought forth in this wonderful book. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to begin our study in our lecture today at the place where we ended in our last lecture. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Now for those of you who were not here for the previous lecture, uh, I recommend that you get a copy of the hard copy as you go out this evening, because you'll be able to review all of the details from our last lecture. But basically what we studied is that Adam and Eve sinned and gave up their position of dominion over the earth. And of course God pronounced upon them the sentence of death. But we found that God came down to the Garden of Eden and He made that wonderful promise to Adam and Eve as they were listening to God speak to the serpent. And those words of God to the serpent were God's declaration of war. And they're found in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. God is speaking here to the serpent. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Three kinds of enmity between the serpent and the woman, between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, and between the seed of the woman and the serpent. The enmity runs in other words in three directions but the real enmity is between the seed of the woman and the serpent. Because the last part of the verse says, He, the seed of the woman, will crush your head, serpent, and you are going to wound, you're going to hurt his heel. In other words, God is saying, I'm going to send a seed to the world and he's going to do battle with you. In the process of the battle you're going to hurt him but by hurting him his foot is going to come down on your head and is going to crush your head. He's going to eliminate you. He's going to destroy you. Now when Satan heard those words he trembled, he shook, and he made up his mind from that point on that he was not going to allow that seed to come to the world. And the first example of this we find in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 25. We all know the story of Cain and Abel probably. The Bible tells us that Cain arose and he killed his brother. Now the question is, was it really Cain who wanted Abel dead? Or was there someone behind the scenes who wanted Abel dead? The fact is, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 12, I'll just refer to it, says, Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and killed his brother. Notice that this text says that Cain was of the wicked one. In other words, Cain did not act alone. The wicked one was behind him, instigating him to kill Abel. Now the question is, why would Satan want Abel dead? Because God had promised in Genesis 3 verse 15 that he was going to send a seed to the world to do battle with him. And he was going to crush his head. And so the devil is thinking maybe this Abel is the promised seed or perhaps the promised seed is going to come from him. So I'm going to nip this in the bud. And so he influences Cain to kill his brother Abel. So when Abel dies, the devil says, mission accomplished. No more seed, because Cain is mine, 
and Abel is dead. But in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 25 we find that God's plan was not frustrated. It says there, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. And then she explains why she called him Seth. Seth means substitute or one who takes the place of. She says this, for God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel whom Cain killed. God has given me another seed. Notice that key word that we find in Genesis 3 verse 15. The seed will crush your head. The devil gets rid of Abel by using Cain and God says I will give Eve another seed. So God's plan was not thwarted. The devil's first method for trying to keep the seed from coming is by trying to directly kill the seed. And we find this clearly in the story of Cain and Abel. You'll notice that the same elements of Genesis 3.15 are found in the story of Cain and Abel. You have a woman who is Eve. You have a serpent because Cain is of the wicked one. You have two seeds which is Cain and Abel. And you also have enmity between the two seeds. And so the first example of Genesis 3.15 is the story of Cain and Abel. Although we know now that Abel was not specifically the promised seed. The seed would come later on from Abel. And so the devil learns that God is not expecting any of these preliminary seeds to crush his head but that what God is doing is that he's preparing a holy line or a lineage from which eventually the seed will come. And so the devil says now I'm going to go to plan B. It does me no good to kill the seed because I kill one seed and God introduces another. So he says I'm going to go to the second method, the second plan. And we find that in Genesis chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2. Genesis chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2. Verses that we're going to study later on when we deal with the flood in the days of Noah. It says, Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful. And they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Notice here that it speaks about marital relationships between the sons of God and the daughters of men. Now I want you to notice before I answer who is uh, the group referred to as the sons of God and which is the group referred to as the daughters of men, I'd like to read verse 5 which shows the results of these unions of the sons of God with the daughters of men. It says in Genesis 6 and verse 5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This evil came as a result of the relationship between the sons of God and the daughters of men. The sons of God going into the daughters of men which is an expression in the Old Testament which means to have sexual relations with. In other words the sons of God entered into marital relationships with the daughters of men. Now the question is who are the sons of God and who are the daughters of men? The best answer is by looking at the context. You look at Genesis chapter 4 and you have the genealogy of Cain, the wicked one. And it's interesting that in the genealogy of Cain you have three women mentioned. And then in Genesis chapter 5 you have the genealogy of Seth. That is the genealogy of the righteous. So in Genesis chapter 4 you have the genealogy of Cain. In Genesis chapter 5 you have the genealogy of Seth. And in Genesis chapter 6 you have the sons of God and the daughters of men. In other words these marriages were actually marriages between the seed of Cain and the seed of the woman. The seed of Abel. 
the seed of Seth, the good and righteous seed. When the righteous and the wicked began to mix together, the world became corrupted. Now let me ask you, how many people do you think lived in this world the day before the flood? A hundred? A thousand? How about five thousand? Anybody give me ten thousand? <laughs> Let me give you some statistics. Between creation and the flood, 1,656 years transpired. In a world where there was no scarcity of natural resources, because most of the effect upon the natural resources came as a result of the flood. In a world where men live to be almost 1,000 years old. How many children can a thousand year old man have? Actually the oldest was 969. In a world where God had told uh, uh, man and woman be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And in Genesis 6 it says that the whole earth was filled with violence. In other words the whole earth was populated. And yet here's the terrifying thought. Of the millions of people that no doubt lived on planet earth before the flood, only eight remained faithful to God. And Genesis says that there was particularly one, Noah was righteous in the eyes of the Lord. What would have happened if God had allowed history to continue without the flood intervening? the human race would have become totally corrupted and God would not have had anyone in a holy line through whom to bring the Messiah into the world. In other words the devil was using two plans. Plan number one, try and kill the seed. Plan number two, try to intermingle and mix the two seeds so that the, the, the genealogy of the righteous would lose its identity and if it lost its identity there could be no promised seed coming from that lineage. Now all throughout the Old Testament we find the devil using these two methods. These are his primary methods in trying to keep the seed from coming. He uses Cain to kill Abel so that the seed can't come. He mixes the sons of God with the daughters of men to make the lineage disappear in its uniqueness so that the seed cannot come. Now I'm going to take you through a tour of many stories in the Old Testament that we need to look at through the lenses of Genesis 3.15. You see in Genesis 3.15 God is saying to Satan, I'm going to send you a seed and your very existence is at stake. So do you think that the devil is going to make it priority number one to keep the seed from coming? Who's going to crush his head? Obviously yes. So we need to read the Old Testament with enlightened eyes. We need to see in the background this controversy between Satan who is trying to keep the seed from coming so his head won't be crushed and God working to bring the seed into the world. I'd like to take you to the time after the flood. We're only going to study certain highlights. The time after the flood Go with me to Genesis chapter 10 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 10 and verse 1. Now we need to understand that Genesis chapter 10 is chronologically after Genesis chapter 11. In other words God gives chapter 10 all of the nations of the earth and then in chapter 11 he explains how those nations came to exist. Now notice Genesis chapter 10 and verse 1. Now this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And sons were born to them after the flood. Notice that Noah had three sons. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now let's go to verse 20. It says in verse 20 the following. These were the sons of Ham according to their families to their languages, in their lands, and in their nations. 
and that is said about each of the sons of Noah. Nations, languages, cultures of the world all came from these three sons. Now if you go to Genesis chapter 11 you'll discover something very interesting. The holy line continues through Shem, one of the sons of Noah. The other two sons, Ham and Japheth, continue the unholy line, if we could say. In fact, if you look at the nations that came from Ham and Japheth, you'll discover that these were the very nations that later tried to destroy Israel. Allow me to just mention some of the nations that came from Japheth. You have Magog. By the way it's mentioned in Revelation chapter 20 as a great enemy of God's people. You have the Medes coming also from Japheth. You have Greece. He's called Javan. You have Tyre, an arch enemy of Israel. And you have Rome mentioned also as one of those who descended from Japheth. Now how about Ham? You have Egypt coming from Ham. You have Assyria which destroyed the ten tribes of the north in Israel, destroyed Samaria in the year 722. Babylon came from Ham. The Canaanites came from Ham. The Philistines. In other words all of these nations which later became enemies of Israel and frequently tied to destroy Israel came from Ham and from Japheth. They were trying to destroy the Shemites. We call them Semites today. And so in Genesis chapter 10 we already find in two of the sons of Noah the devil from them forming the nations through which he is going to try and destroy Israel. Now there's a fundamental misunderstanding and that is that the devil hated Israel. That the devil, you know, he wanted to get rid of Israel. But the fact is folks that the battle of Satan against Israel is not because the devil hates Israel, it's because the devil hates Israel's Messiah. Because God had promised that from this lineage the Messiah would come. And so when the devil is trying to blend Israel with the nations to cause them to lose their identity, when he tries to destroy Israel, we're going to know several, notice several examples from the Bible, the devil is not focused primarily against Israel. Attacking Israel and trying to destroy Israel is the way in which he can cut off the holy line and keep the Messiah from coming. Are you following what I'm saying? This is the way we need to read it. Everything the devil does in the Old Testament is to keep the sea from coming because his very existence is at stake. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 11 and verse 4. This is happening about a hundred years after the flood. The experience of the Tower of Babel. It says there in chapter 11 and verse 4 that those who had gathered in this uh, valley said this, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now we're going to study later on that their intention was to establish what we call today a new world order. Centered in their capital, which will unite all of humanity in rebellion against God. And when their plan failed, the name which was given to that place according to verse 9 was Babel. Have you ever heard of Babel before? In the book of Revelation the arch enemy of God's people is called what? Babylon. Here you have the origin of Babylon. You know it's interesting that there where the tower of Babel was built lived the family of a very very well known man. His name was Abraham. He lived in the very place where these tower builders 
had the intention of establishing a society in rebellion against God. In fact, the name of the individual who was the ringleader in the building of the Tower of Babel was Nimrod, and the name Nimrod means rebellion. It was a rebellious endeavor. And Abraham lived in that area in Ur of the Chaldees. Chaldea is ancient Babylon. And we find that Abraham and his family were starting to be defiled by the gods in that place. Go with me to the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 24 and verses 2 and 3. Joshua chapter 24 and verses 2 and 3. I want you to notice what was happening to Abraham and his family who lived there in this apostate area known as Babel or Babylon. It says, And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river, that's the river Euphrates incidentally, in old times. And what was the problem? They what? They served other gods. Were they becoming defiled by the gods of Babylon? They most certainly were. And it says in verse 3, Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, that is the river Euphrates, led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied, it says here, his descendants, in the King James Version it says his seed, and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. What was the problem there in Babel where they had planned to form a society in rebellion against God? The problem is that Abraham lived there and it says that he and his family were serving other gods. But God had plans for Abraham. He could not fulfill his plans for Abraham there in Babel in Ur. And so it, we're told here that God took Abraham out of the place where they were serving other gods to take him to the land of Canaan. And God had a special plan for Abraham. God had to take him away so that he would not become defiled with those nations and eventually the holy seed which would come from Abraham would disappear. You see God knew that what the devil was trying to do so he took Abraham out because God had plans to do something very special with Abraham. Let's notice what it is. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. And then we'll jump down to verse 3. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country. Notice, God says, Get out of your country. Get out of Babylon. We're going to find in Revelation there's a call to come out of Babylon in the end time. Get out of your country from your family. Because his family was serving other gods, we noticed in Joshua and from your father's house. Verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be what? All the families of the earth shall be blessed. What plans did God have with Abraham? He had plans that through Abraham, all of the nations of the earth would be blessed. But now listen to what I'm going to say. It wasn't Abraham who was going to bring the blessing. It was the seed of Abraham. Abraham was the instrument to bring the seed eventually into the world. Notice what we find there in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18. We'll be studying Genesis 22 later on in our seminar. God says to Abraham this, In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Notice that in, in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3 God says, In you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Here he explains that it is in the seed of Abraham that all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. You see, God was planning to bring the blessing into the world through the seed of Abraham. Now go with me to Galatians chapter uh, 3, and let's notice who that seed is. Galatians chapter 3, and we've read this verse before, verse 16, 3 verse 16. It says there, Now to Abraham and his seed 
where the promise is made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. Who was the seed of Abraham through whom all of the nations of the earth were going to be blessed? It was Christ according to the Apostle Paul. In other words God called Abraham out of Babylon, out of Ur of the Chaldees because he and his family were becoming defiled with the gods there. They were going to lose their identity. Satan was doing the same thing as he did before the flood. Blending the two seeds. So God took him out to Canaan and he says in your seed all of the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now the devil knew that God had a special plan with Abraham and he knew that God had promised Abraham that he was going to give him a seed. So now the devil says to Abraham it's been many many years and you don't have any seed. Your wife can't even have any children. And so the devil whispers in his ear, Abraham, maybe there's a different plan that God is contemplating here. Maybe you need to have children in a different fashion. So the devil whispers in Sarah's ear, Sarah, tell your husband to take the slave woman, Hagar, and perhaps the seed will come from Hagar. Notice what we find in Genesis chapter 16 and verse 2. Genesis chapter 16 and verse 2. It says there, So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from having children. She blames the Lord, but it wasn't the Lord. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Do you think that was just the voice of Sarai? Absolutely not. Because you have Genesis 3.15 in the background. Everything the devil does, he does with the intention of keeping the seed from coming or destroying the seed. Now why is the birth of this child significant? The name of the child that Abraham had with Sarai was Ishmael. Do you know what Ishmael wanted to do with Isaac when Isaac the son of the promise was born? He wanted to destroy him. Who do you suppose was using Ishmael whom he had convinced Abraham and Sarai to have to kill Isaac the son of the promise? There's no doubt that the devil was the one who wanted Isaac dead. And you say well where does the Bible say that? Well in Galatians, in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 29 Galatians chapter 4 and verse 29 we find uh, this reference to Ishmael it says there in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 29 but as he who was born according to the flesh that is Ishmael then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit even so it is now what did the child of the flesh Ishmael do? He persecuted the child who was born according to the Spirit. Who was behind Ishmael? It must have been Satan. Because Satan was behind Cain, wasn't he? In destroying Abel. Satan is fighting for his own existence. He's trying to keep the seed from coming. And then a little bit later on you have another birth. Actually two births twins. You have Jacob and you have Esau. Have you ever read the story of Esau and Jacob? Whose character did Esau have? Who was Esau like? Like God? He took wives in Canaan when his father said don't take wives, he said I will if I want to. He sold his birthright for a plate of lentils. He didn't consider the fact that the, he who had the birthright would bring the Messiah into the world. Eventually he says, who cares when you're hungry? And so he sold that for a plate of lentils. And we're told in Genesis chapter 27 and verse 41. Genesis chapter 27 and verse 41. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing which was with his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, I will what? 
I will kill my brother Jacob. Who do you suppose was behind the idea of using Esau to kill his brother Jacob? There's no doubt whatsoever that the devil knew that Jacob was going to play a very important role in the plan of salvation that God was developing. In fact, the twelve from the twelve sons of Jacob was going to come the promised seed specifically from Judah. Now we move forward a little bit more to the days of Joseph. And in our lecture tomorrow we're going to study a little bit more about this experience of Joseph because it's very very interesting. It, it has much to do with what we're talking about this evening. I'm going to make a long story short. But Joseph suffered many injustices. Everything seemed to go wrong and he was a good kid. He was sold as a slave to Egypt. Because he refused to commit adultery he ended up in prison. Anyone would have thought why should I even bother to serve God? Look what happens to those who serve God. But he knew that God had a plan. And of course the plan was eventually to become the prime minister of Egypt so that when seven years of plenty came he could administrate and store the excess that the land produced so that when the seven years of famine came society could survive. Now at the end of the story Joseph reveals himself to his brothers and his brothers they, they, they hug Joseph and they say oh Joseph we're so sorry for what we did please forgive us. Do you know what Joseph says? Go with me to Genesis chapter 45. Genesis chapter 45 and verses 5 through 7. Genesis 45 and verses 5 through 7. Joseph says, but now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve what? Life. For these two years the famine has been in the land and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And now notice verse 7, and God sent me before you to preserve a what? A posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Do you suppose that God knew that the devil was going to cause those seven years of famine? What was the devil's intention? His intention was to starve Jacob and his family to death. But God knowing it sent Joseph beforehand down into Egypt to make provision as it says here to preserve the posterity. Other versions translate it to preserve the seed. Do you see what's going on here in the background? All of these events that are taking place are revealing a plot that is taking place beyond history, behind history. We only see external events. But when we know that God told the devil, the seed is going to come and he's going to crush your head. We know that the devil says, I can't let the seed come. And so through all of these circumstances and events, the devil is trying to keep the seed from coming. Now there's so much more that we could say. I'm not going to read all of the verses, but I'm going to I'm going to give you the concept. Notice Genesis chapter 15 verses 13 and 14. Moving on a little bit, little bit further forward in history. Genesis chapter 15 and verses 13 and 14. Here God is giving a prophecy to Abraham. And it says there, Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs. And will serve them and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. What is God saying? He's saying your people are going to be taken down into a certain land. We know that that was Egypt. And at the end of four hundred years I am going to bring them out of the land of Egypt. And in other places he says, I'm going to take them to the land of Canaan. 
Now, isn't it interesting that God would promise to take Israel out of Egypt and to Canaan? Do you know that God had promised Abraham and his seed the land of Canaan? Many people today believe that, uh, that the Jewish nation owns the land of Israel by divine right. But do you know as we study the scripture we discover that the reason why God gave Abraham the land of Canaan and his seed the land of Canaan is because God had plans for the Messiah to born, be born in that land. Was Jesus born in what was before the land of Canaan? He most certainly was. He was born in Bethlehem of Judea. That used to be Canaan. And so the devil, he heard that prophecy 400 years after that. He's going to take them out. He's going to lead them to Canaan. Do you suppose the devil wanted them to go to Canaan where the Messiah was going to be born? Absolutely not. So what did the devil do with Pharaoh? Was it easy for Israel to leave Egypt? It was a battle. A supernatural battle. In fact, do you know that in Ezekiel chapter 29 and verse 3, Pharaoh is called the great dragon? Pharaoh is called the great dragon because he's the dragon seed. And Pharaoh is going to do everything in his power to keep Israel from leaving Egypt. Who do you suppose didn't want Israel to leave Egypt? It wasn't Pharaoh alone. It was Satan because Satan knew this prophecy. He knew that if Israel went to the land of Canaan, the promised seed was going to be born there because he had seen God take Abraham out of Babel, out of Ur, to take him to the land of Canaan. The devil knew that there was something special which was going to happen in Canaan, and he was not going to allow Israel to leave to go to Canaan. Israel arrived at the borders of the promised land. They sent out spies. Ten of the spies came back with a bad report. There's giants there. We can't go in there. Who do you suppose was the one who instilled in them this idea that you can't go into the land of Canaan? You're not strong enough. Go back to Egypt. It wasn't God. It wasn't their idea. Whose idea was it? Who did not want them to go into the land of Canaan? Satan. And then 40 years later they arrive at the borders of the promised land again about to enter the land of Canaan and you have the experience of Numbers chapter 25 and I'll just tell you something about it. They're ready to go into the promised land and Balaam is invited to curse Israel and he can't curse Israel because Israel is in a good relationship with God. And so finally Balaam tells Balak, the king, he says, the only way that, that these people can ever be defeated is if you corrupt them from inside. You can't destroy them from outside because their relationship with God is right. The only way you can do it is by corrupting them from inside. Do you know what happened? The women, the idolatrous women of Moab came and enticed the children of Israel, the men of Israel, to have illicit sexual relations and to practice idolatry and to worship the gods of Moab. 23,000 of the cream of Israel fell on the borders of the promised land because of the blending and the mixing of the two seeds. Once again, behind the scenes is Satan working to keep the seed from coming. God working to bring the seed into the world. Why do you suppose the nations of Canaan stood up against Israel? They were not going to give Israel this land because something special was going to happen in that land. Satan knew it because God took Abraham to that land. He took Israel to that land. He says, I know the seed is going to be born in that land. And by the way, do you know that Mount Moriah, which is the place where Abraham took his son Isaac and placed him on the altar, Mount Moriah was the last place that David conquered in establishing the city of Jerusalem. The devil was not going to give up Mount Moriah without a fight because Mount Moriah is the very place where later on the temple of Solomon was built. We're going to discuss that later on. And then of course we have the story of David. 
Do you know that in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 12 and 13, and I'm kind of going a little bit fast here, we can't read all the verses, you have them on the list, I hope that you look them up in the light of what we're studying. God said that the throne of David would be forever, God would give David a seed who would sit on his throne forever. Now let me ask you, who was that seed? Luke chapter 1 verses 32 and 33 tells us that that seed from the house of David was Jesus. Do you suppose the devil knew that the Messiah was going to be a son of David? Do you suppose he heard this promise that God made? Of course he did. Why do you think David had so many problems? For example, he's sitting in the palace playing his harp for Saul twice and Saul who is possessed by an evil spirit the Bible says took his spear and he hurled it at David to nail him to the wall whose idea was that? Is that Saul's idea? I don't think so it was the evil spirit who wanted to see David dead? why would he want David dead? because the seed was going to come from whom? from David then you can go to 1st Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 1 God had told David don't you number Israel because your strength is in me not in numbers and it says there in 1st Chronicles 21 and verse 1 that Satan enticed David to number Israel it was his intention that by numbering Israel God would destroy David because the seed was going to come from David and then of course you have the sad experience of David and Bathsheba the idle mind is the devil's workshop the Bible says that David should have been out to war but he was idle in the palace of course he goes out sees this beautiful woman to make a long story short commits adultery with her and then has her husband murdered in battle do you know what the penalty in, in God's law in the Old Testament under the theocracy what was the punishment for adultery and murder? the person was to be taken out and stoned who do you suppose wanted David stoned? Satan you say this, this idea of committing adultery and killing did not merely come from David's mind there is one who wanted to destroy David not because he hated David but because he hated the seed who would come from David are you catching a picture here? all of the Old Testament must be seen within this framework of Genesis 3.15 because it's a battle for self-existence it's priority number one and then of course you have the story of Solomon you know I have several verses here, 1st Kings chapter 11 verses 1 and 1 to 3 says that Solomon you know who was the wisest man who ever lived and he also became the most foolish man who ever lived because when he was a young, when he was a young man he went astray from the Lord, do you know why he went astray? because basically he had a thousand wives and do you know where those wives were from? you can read it in this passage in 1st Kings chapter 11 they were from the pagan nations which surrounded Israel now why do you suppose the devil wanted Solomon to blend with the women from other pagan nations? because he was hoping that Solomon would lose the identity from whom the seed would come because Solomon was the son of David he was from the lineage of David and the Messiah was going to come from the lineage of Solomon I could give you so many other stories you have Sennacherib the king of Assyria who comes and destroys the ten, the ten kingdoms of the north which is known as Israel then he comes against Judah he's going to destroy Jerusalem and the Assyrians were known for committing genocide I mean they didn't take any prisoners they uprooted whole nations and when they surrounded Jerusalem 185,000 soldiers ready to strike the angel of the Lord came out and in one night slew 185,000 soldiers delivering Judah the two tribes of the south 
The devil was the one who led Israel to mix with the nations so that they would be expelled from the promised land to Babylon. Have you ever noticed that? That because of their sins, mixing with the nations, Israel was taken captive to Babylon, they were expelled from the land. Do you know that God had told Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 28 that if they were unfaithful they would be expelled from the land. And the devil was really happy when they were expelled from the land because he knew that the Messiah was going to be born in the land. This is what the taking and the losing of the land is all about. It's not about Israel, it is about Israel's Messiah. And then you have the story of Esther. You have Esther 3 and verse 13 there. It says that a man called Haman prepared a plot and he worked upon the mind of the king. It says to destroy and to slay and to kill all the Jews in a certain day. I suppose the devil hates the Jews. I believe he hates everybody. But why would he want to uproot the Jewish nation after the captivity? Because he knew that from the Jews would come the promised seed. You see the Old Testament is seed centered. It is not Israel centered. Israel could not give the devil a death blow on his head. The devil overcame them. But there was one who could and that was the Messiah Jesus Christ. Notice Ezra chapter 9 and verse 2. The devil was not only trying to destroy Israel after the captivity, he was trying to do something else as well. Ezra chapter 9 and verse 2. Ezra is that little book right before Nehemiah. I'm sure that helps you an awful lot. It says here after the captivity, for they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons. The nobles that is, those who had kingly blood. So that the holy seed is mixed with the peoples of those lands. Indeed the hand of the leaders and rulers had been, has been foremost in this trespass. What was the devil leading the nobles to do after the captivity? He was leading them to intermingle with the nations, to mix, according to this, the holy seed. And so all throughout the Old Testament, Satan is working by trying to kill the seed, by trying to corrupt the seed, that is the lineage from whom the seed will come, the devil is trying to keep the prophecy of Genesis 3.15 from being fulfilled. But we find that in the fullness of time God sent forth His Son born of a woman. The devil was not able to keep Him from coming. When the moment came, the fullness of time came, God sent His Son to this world. And Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1 tells us that He was the seed of Abraham and He was the seed of David. By the way, don't you find it interesting that you have in Genesis chapter 11 you have the genealogy from the days of Adam until the days of Noah. In Genesis, that's Genesis 5, in Genesis chapter 11 you have the genealogy from the times of Shem the son of Noah to the, son of, to the days of Abraham. And in Matthew chapter 1 you have the genealogy from the days of Abraham till the times of Christ. And after that genealogy you don't have any more genealogies. In fact the Apostle Paul says don't get caught up in genealogies, they're not important anymore because the purpose for the genealogies was to trace the holy line of the Messiah. And so Jesus was born, the seed of Abraham, the solitary seed through whom all of the nations of the earth were going to be what? Were going to be blessed. Did the devil know that he had been born? Did the devil know where he was going to be born? Oh yes. So the devil says, I wasn't able to keep him from coming. I wasn't able to destroy Israel. I wasn't able to intermingle Israel with the nations to lose their identity. He has come. So what does the devil do when Jesus is born? Go with me to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. And I want you to notice verse 3. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 3. It says here, 
And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them down to the earth. And now notice, and the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Do you have the same elements here as Genesis 3.15? Do you have a woman? Sure. Do you have a seed of the woman? Sure. Do you have a dragon or a serpent? Yes. Do you have enmity? You most certainly do. This is the first fulfillment of Genesis 3 verse 15 where it says he, the seed of the woman, will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. In other words, Jesus is born into the world and the devil tries to nip him in the bud, tries to destroy him. But we find in verse 5 that it tells us she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So the child escaped the hands of Satan. In fact, Jesus came to this world and he lived a perfect life the life that you and I should live. And when I receive him he gives me his life. He credits his life to my account. And then at the end of his life he died. He died the death that I should die. He died for my sins. He never allowed himself to be overcome by Satan. In other words he fulfilled the promises, promise of Genesis 3.15. He gave a death blow to the devil on his head. And then Jesus went back to heaven. Now the story doesn't end there. Because when Jesus ascends back to heaven, the devil says, now I have to take second best. I wasn't able to defeat the seed of the woman. And so now I'm going to go after the woman. And in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 13, if you go with me there, we find the devil persecuting the woman who brought the seed into the world. And by the way we're going to find that the woman represents the church. The woman represents the church. In this case of the Old Testament church brought Jesus into the world and then after Jesus ascends to the throne the church continues and is persecuted by Satan. Notice Revelation chapter 12 and verse 13. It says here, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Does Genesis 3.15 say that there was going to be enmity between the serpent and the woman? Yes? yes? Is that being described here in Revelation 12? Enmity between the serpent and the woman? Yes. Is that the primary enmity? No. The primary enmity is that the seed of the woman is going to crush the serpent's head. That's enmity number one. The enmity between the serpent and the woman is a secondary enmity. Do you notice that in Revelation chapter 12 you have that exact idea? Because it says that the child is born from the woman, the child defeats the serpent, and he's caught up to God into his throne. Then the devil says, I wasn't able to defeat him, so I'm going after whom? I'm going after the woman. And there you have the other type of enmity. I'm going to go against the church. And that's the reason why during the period of the Roman Empire you have these savage persecutions against the church, the body of Christ. During the Middle Ages you have a savage persecution also against God's faithful followers. Millions of them died in the period of the Middle Ages. Because now the devil was not able to destroy the seed, Jesus, so he has to take second best, the seed's seed, if you please. Now let's go to Galatians chapter 3, very quickly, and then we'll go to our last verse, Revelation 12, verse 17. Galatians chapter 3, and verse 27. Galatians chapter 3, and verse 27. This is a very, very important verse because it speaks about the seed's seed. You see, the, the only true seed is whom? Jesus. It doesn't say to seeds as of many, but to your seed, which is one, Christ. But now notice, 
Galatians 3 verse 27 for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have what? have put on Christ and now notice verse 29 very important verse and if you are Christ's how do we become Christ's? we just read it in verse 27 how do we become Christ's? we become Christ's at baptism and so it says if you therefore if you are Christ's then you are what? you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise so the question is who is the seed of Abraham today? the seed of Abraham is Christ but who else is the seed of Abraham? those who have accepted Jesus Christ question do you suppose the devil hates the church as much as he hates Christ? of course because the church is the body of Christ so the final persecution is going to be against Abraham's seed Abraham's spiritual seed who have received Jesus as their Lord and Savior final verse Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17 speaks about this final persecution and the four elements of Genesis 3.15 are here and the dragon was enraged with the woman there you have the woman, the serpent and he went to make war, there you have the enmity with the rest of her offspring actually it should see the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ <laughs>